Dear final year medical students, it's my pleasure to introduce to you some of the pediatric orthopedic deformities we frequently meet in our clinical practice as orthopedic surgeons. My name is Dr. Neriman Avloyun. I'm lecturer of orthopedic surgery at Asyut University. The subjects we're covering in this lecture include developmental dysplasia of the hip and coxa vera in the lower limb and cubitus varus and cubitus valgus of the upper limb. Let's start with developmental dysplasia of the hip or DDH. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons defines DDH as a condition in which the femoral head has an abnormal relationship to the acetabulum. An older name of the same problem was CDH or congenital dislocation of the hip which was replaced in the 80s to include hips that are normal at birth and in which dysplasia or dislocation subsequently develop. This is a slide showing the neonatal hip. As you can see, the femoral head and greater trochanter are made of cartilage as well as a major part of the acetabulum. This cartilage will later on in life undergo ossification leaving only the thin layer of articular hyaline cartilage. This slide shows the pelvis of a child approaching skeletal maturity. As you can still see the physial plates of the femur and the acetabulum, showing bilateral neglected hip dislocation with abnormally shallow acetabuli. In this pelvis x-ray of a child you can notice that on the right side there is a normal relationship between the femoral head and the acetabulum, while on the left side, where the arrow is pointing, the hip joint is dislocated. Risk factors include the firstborn female, positive family history, breech presentation, generalized ligamentous laxity, and postnatal positioning of the hip like we see in this picture. Cultures that adopt abducted hip positions for babies seem to have less DDH. A dislocated hip develops secondary changes. The capsule becomes tight in an hourglass fashion. Ligamentum teres is stretched, thus becomes bulkier. The labrum or limbus, which is a fibrocartilaginous rim around the acetabulum, gets pushed by the dislocated femoral head into an inverted position. The acetabular cavity gradually fills up with fibro fatty tissue called pulvinar. All these secondary changes may with time increase the difficulty and prevent reduction of the femoral head into the acetabulum. This slide again reviews the altered anatomy resulting in difficulty of reduction of the hip. Shortened tendons of the adductor longus and the iliopsoas muscles can also prevent reduction. The femoral head, being outside its normal acetabular socket, often has an altered shape as well. Even without dislocation, dysplastic hips suffer long-term problems including early degeneration due to smaller surface area of the articular surfaces carrying the same weight resulting in higher pressure. In this x-ray, the right acetabulum has a large surface area and can distribute weight over a greater surface of the femoral head, unlike the left acetabulum where forces are concentrated over a smaller part of the femoral head articular cartilage, leading to premature degeneration and early onset osteoarthritis. DDH diagnosis is reached through clinical signs and imaging techniques. The first thing the mother can notice is the asymmetry. Skin folds may not match on both thighs due to hip dislocation. The dislocated hip has a smaller abduction range compared to the normal hip. Abduction of the flexed hip with pressure over the greater trochanter can reduce a dislocated hip early in infancy. A clunk of reduction can be felt. This is called a positive ortolani test. 
Later on, a dislocated hip may become irreducible with a negative ortholanyl test, with the hip still dislocated. This sign is seen only in unilateral DDH. In bilateral cases, both thighs will be equally shortened due to the dislocation. Radiographically, taking a good look at these X-ray views of the pelvis of a child, we can see that the left femoral head with a small ossific nucleus sits outside the bony acetabulum. The right femoral head sits nicely in the acetabulum and has a more developed ossific nucleus. In neonates, the ossific nucleus is not yet developed, so an ultrasound examination can detect the position of the cartilaginous femoral head within the acetabulum. It can also judge the size and orientation of the acetabulum and detect acetabular dysplasia with or without frank dislocation. Ultrasound can also help guide early treatment and detect improvement in the infants younger than six months old. What are the possible lines of treatment for DDH? It greatly depends upon the age of the patient. In the newborn, abduction bracing like pelvic harness or other abduction braces can be enough. Improvement in acetabular development can be detected by repeated ultrasound examination. Traction was used in the past to facilitate reduction, but now is generally not used. In older infants, general anesthesia is needed to reduce the hip, and after closed reduction is performed, the new position is maintained through a hip spica cast. Let's take a second look at this slide to remember the secondary changes that occur in the dislocated hip with time. These changes can prevent non-operative reduction and might necessitate an operative or a surgical reduction. After the age of 18 months, usually an open reduction is needed to lengthen the shortened structures and remove the pulvinar sitting within the empty acetabulum. Capsulography is needed to remove the redundancy and tighten the capsule after reduction of the hip joint. Acetabular osteotomy is needed in older age to correct the orientation of the acetabulum and provide sufficient coverage of the femoral head to distribute weight and prevent redislocation. The osteotomy is usually a wedge opening osteotomy where a native bone graft from the iliac wing or the femur is inserted in the anterolateral aspect of the osteotomy to provide coverage. Femoral shortening is needed in children older than two years. The removed segment can be used as a graft in the wedge opening acetabular osteotomy as previously mentioned. In bilateral hip dislocation in a child older than eight, it is recommended not to reduce the hips, as the failure rate is considerably high. The patient will walk with a waddling gait, but with no pain. Later in life, when hip degeneration occurs, total hip replacement or arthroplasty can be performed with better results. The second lower extremity problem we're discussing is coxa vara. As you can see in the x-ray, the femoral neck is not similar on both sides. The neck shaft angle on the right side is almost 90 degrees, while on the left side it is within its normal range of 120 to 140 degrees. The greater trochanter is higher on the right side than the left side. A supratrochanteric shortening of the right lower extremity is present, which causes a slack in the abductor muscle pull and results in Trendelenburg gait on the right side. Not only is the neck shaft angle abnormal on the right side, but also the physial line is more vertical, as you can see. Causes of coxavara vary. It can result from congenital, traumatic, or metabolic causes. 
The main line of treatment is surgical correction through a subtrochanteric valgization osteotomy and fixation with tension band wires in the very young or a fixed ankle device in the older child, avoiding injury to the physeal plate. Now we shift to the upper extremity. In the frontal plane, the normal elbow has a valgus angle called the carrying angle of about 10 degrees, slightly larger in females. Varus angulation of the elbow, as we see in figure A, is called cubitus varus. Exaggerated valgus angulation, as in figure B, is called cubitus valgus. Cubitus varus is a famous deformity resulting from malunited supracondylar fracture of the humerus. It often fails to correct spontaneously and remains into the adult life causing a disability. As we can see in this x-ray, the distal humerus is deformed and the elbow joint line is oblique. Surgical correction is needed in severe cases causing disability depending upon the age the suitable method of fixation is chosen. In this adult patient, a plate and screw fixation was necessary. Cubitus valgus, on the other hand, is a complication of another type of fracture at the distal humerus. It results from ununited fracture of the lateral condyle of the humerus with both its types. As we can see in this x-ray, the lateral condyle, or the capitellum, is ununited with no bony continuity with the rest of the humerus. The elbow joint line gradually drifts into valgus, which causes gradual stretch of the ulnar nerve running behind the medial epicondyle and resulting in what we call tardy ulnar nerve palsy. The standard line of management is surgery, freshening of the non-union site, reduction of the fragment, and internal fixation using a compression screw is needed. In figure B, we see full union of the lateral fragment and the wires and screws can now be removed. This is one of the chromosomal abnormalities where cubitus valgus is seen bilaterally and is not a complication of fractures. In this case, there is also short stature, webbing of the neck, a low hairline, and female hypogonadism. Yes, think of Turner syndrome. That was all. Thank you very much and good luck.